This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Greetings, my friends. Our first show of March 2016, different month, but same mission, bringing you all the latest ag happenings from around the great state of Georgia. Welcome to the Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Yeah, we got a mixed bag of stuff for you on today's program. We're even talking pork. That's right. Mark Wildman talks to one expert about what the industry here in Georgia is doing to make things more cost efficient. Also on the program, teaching ag education may not be for everyone, but we'll highlight one program that's not only helping educators along the way, but also producing leaders in the process. And then later, see how a Georgia businessman took his passion for farming and turned it into a showcase for locally grown products. All this and more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Georgia pork producers held an important meeting recently here at the Georgia Farm Bureau headquarters building in Macon. The meeting brought producers together to learn about industry topics and network with other producers. The Monitor's Mark Wildman has the story. The pork industry in Georgia may not be as large as some other livestock industries, but it is still very important to the state's economy. In Macon, Georgia pork producers held a very important industry meeting to help farmers. We're here today really for two different things. We're here because we're required to uh, get so many hours of year continuing education. The other part of today is uh, dealing with other issues in our industry. The folks from the university come down and kind of keep us updated on what's going on in the industry. Topics ranged from learning about disease threats to the industry to how to calibrate center pivots. And it was all focused on advancing the Georgia industry an industry that has changed a great deal over the years. Well, there's not a lot of us left. Uh, farms are typically larger than they have been in the past, and um, we face uh, a lot of regulatory issues that hasn't been a problem in the past, along with uh, market issues, disease issues. One of the most important resources farmers have in Georgia is access to good research and UGA works year-round to help producers stay out in front of many issues they may face. One of our focuses has been trying to find ingredients that might be unique to the southeast that would make our producers a little bit more, more uh, profitable, that you know, buying Midwest feed ingredients is often more costly than it would be in the Midwest because they, they have to be transported here. So, so we've looked at things like wheat that can be grown in the southeast or, or triticale or, or oats. Um, poultry byproduct meal, things like that that are, that are more, maybe a little bit less expensive down here than might be in, in the Midwest. The meeting was held at the Georgia Farm Bureau's headquarters in Macon. And as always, Farm Bureau is eager to assist commodity groups. This building has been a, a big asset to us. It, it's centrally located in the state. We're producers from North Georgia, South Georgia. This is kind of the gathering place for us. So its location is a benefit to people all over the state. Plus, it's a beautiful facility. One of the main challenges for the industry is attracting good workers. And the pork industry, as well as all of agriculture, depends on a highly skilled workforce. Right now in the Animal Science Department, we have about 45 graduate students. And they're working on master's degree or, or PhDs in, in a variety of areas. Uh, the ones that work with me would be more in the swine nutrition area and they can often go on to jobs in the feed industry, very, very good jobs, very, there's high demand for graduates with masters and PhDs in, in all fields of nutrition, dairy nutrition, poultry nutrition, swine nutrition, uh, just the demand for those, they're, they're good jobs, um, often as tech service people representing feed companies that might have products or, or specialty ingredients like enzymes, things like that. The Georgia Pork Producers Association annual meeting may not be the largest commodity meeting of the year, but it is an important gathering in Georgia for an industry responsible for keeping bacon on our plates and adding dollars to the state's economy. Reporting from Macon, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. In other ag news now, an economic analysis of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement released by the American Farm Bureau shows a significant income boost for farmers. 
Farm Bureau economist Veronica Nye says once ratified, TPP will increase farm income by billions of dollars. Our analysis indicates that congressional passage of the agreement would boost net farm income by $4.4 billion per year, led by increased exports of $5.3 billion per year. It's a significant deal for U.S. agriculture. With implementation, we expect livestock receipts, those from beef, pork, and poultry, to be $5.8 billion higher than a situation without approval. And the crop sector, including fruits and vegetables, is expected to be up $2.7 billion in receipts. Georgia cotton growers, there's still time to vote for the Georgia Cotton Commission referendum. Ballots must be postmarked by March 8th. Now, if you still haven't received your ballot, you can contact the GCC office or the Georgia Department of Ag to request a ballot. For more information, just visit GeorgiaCottonCommission.com. Meantime, a lot of you may be familiar with the work FFA does through agriculture education here in Georgia. Now today we take a look at one positive aspect of the industry certification program that is highly touted amongst state educators, both those connected to agriculture and those on the outside of the industry. Lula Curry Williams is the FFA advisor at Macon Bibbs Northeast High School. Now it may not be the first place that comes to mind when you think of the future farmers of America. Chris Corzine, Central Region Ag Educator Director through the Georgia Department of Ed, points out that educators have recognized there is so much more to the industry than simply being on a farm. Uh, today's agricultural uh, education classrooms, uh, they're not just about sows, cows, and plows. They're also about leaders, speakers, and job seekers. We deal with agriculture every day. Everything that we deal with uh, you know, just in our communities, our, our yards, you know, the grass growing in it, the, the weeds growing in it, how do we take care of that stuff? Uh, the shrubbery that we're putting in there for our decorations, you know, what color, when do we need to plant them, what time of year that they're gonna grow and look the best? And the thing about it is we're teaching that in our high schools to these kids that they're gonna take with them for the rest of their life. Williams has students that are involved in learning in the classroom, a greenhouse, an outside garden, and a floral design shop made possible by FFA. You have uh, the organization itself, you know, the FFA, and then we have uh, the SAE, the supervised projects, and then we have the classroom and laboratory. Uh, those are the three components of agriculture, and they connect together. We can't do without, we can't have one without the other. So the organization, when they join that, it gives them a a worldwide things where they can venture out into the different careers you know that they want to. One of the students in Williams Ag class said being part of FFA has made a significant impact on how she plans to proceed with her education. Agriculture is important because it's the way that humans survive whether it's through food, clothing, transportation, all of that. It's not just about food because a lot of people in Northeast thinks it's about farming but it's so much more. And Ms. Curry just teaches us an aspect of that, but when we go out and interact with other FFA chapters, we really get to learn more about the animal industry, the clothing industry, even the communication industry. Because without agriculture, humans would not really have progress throughout the years. Kevin Chomp, a major force among ag educators in the classroom for the Central Region, told us that because of the ag industry certification standards, programs like this one at Northeast is flourishing. Uh, Throughout the state of Georgia, uh, agriculture teachers and, and other CTA teachers uh, have the opportunity to be industry certified. And, and basically that's a stamp of approval that comes from industry about what's going on and what they're doing. You know, a lot, a lot of teachers have the credentials that, that they've gained from uh, college education and teaching experience, and they have some tools, but the, the, the stamp of approval that comes from industry and uh, their support of what's going on uh, is essential really to, to provide the quality education that students need to, to really be successful. And the funny thing is the kids, they, re, they don't even realize that they're learning the things that they're learning. You know, they, oh, we go to the greenhouse, we do this, we do that. The thing about it is you're really learning something, they're truly learning something while they're out there. Up next on the monitor, what you get when you combine a butcher shop, a farmer's market, and a cafe all under one roof. Ray D'Alessio has the answer. Stay with us. Hi, my name is Fred Dunaway. I'm from Hawkinsville, Georgia. The 2016 winner of the Georgia Young Peanut Farmer Award. My dad's been farming for a long time. I started when I got out of college in uh, 1998 with him. 
and uh, operation just grown in acres and also in technology. There's a lot of new technology that's come out in the last 15, 20 years and you kind of have to wade through it. Some of it is uh, very worth you know, the money, some of it's not. We started using the uh, auto steering, RTK auto steering 10 or 12 years ago and, and that, that's something that really pays for itself. It allows you to work more land with uh, less employees and um, you know, kind of helps diversify your equipment. Uh, takes away some of the fatigue and some of the operator error. Uh, we also use a system called Green Seeker on my uh, sprayer and, and nitrogen applicators. It actually uses a uh, NDVI reading off of a lens to uh, take a picture of plant health and it's an on-the-go uh, variable rate of uh, different chemicals in nitrogen and fertilizers. The variable rate of the fertilizer and your chemicals uh, not only saves money but also saves product and you're not putting a chemical out there in the environment that's not necessary at the time. And uh, American farmers are some of the best stewards of farming in the world as far as the least amount of chemicals and stuff that we use per acre. Yeah, the younger people to uh, get involved in agriculture, it's, it's gonna be a difficult road. It's, uh, we're in some trying times. There's a lot of, uh, the population of America is uh, removed from the farm by so many generations now, and there's such a small number of uh, actual farmers that Getting, getting started and having the uh, you know, apprenticeship of someone to show you the ropes is uh, difficult. Credit, getting credit is going to be difficult. It's, if you're in farming to make money, you're in the wrong business. It's just there's too many hours, there's too much stress. But uh, if you just really got it in your heart and it's a, you have a passion for it, then it's, it's very enjoyable. If you find a job you know you love, then you never work a day in your life. You always heard that. And I love being uh, able to work with, with the family and have the kids. My kids come out. I got a, a girl and a boy. And, of course, they love playing in the dirt and riding tractors. What kid, you know, doesn't like tractors? So, I uh, feel very blessed. And staying on the subject, peanut growers got to hear the latest on the more than 30 research projects conducted by the University of Georgia, Georgia Tech, and the USDA recently. In 2015, the Georgia Peanut Commission awarded nearly 400,000 to peanut research across the state in hopes of reducing input costs by improving both techniques and technology. You know, in 2015, 2016, we're looking at ways that we can produce that same great Georgia peanut with less money. And that's come out to the real, I think, the real secret to survival in the next two or three years is how can we do this and do it with less money. The Georgia Peanut Commission Board also approved additional funding this past year to provide the Georgia Peanut team with a tractor that is compatible to four row equipment and is equipped with GPS guidance. Meantime, it was about four years ago that Kelly Products CEO and founder Keith Kelly really saw the need and demand for fresh locally grown food. Now sure, his company was already successful at providing products and services spanning all segments of the agribusiness industry, but Keith was thinking beyond that. He wanted something big, something that would provide folks that demand for locally grown food year round. His vision, a grocery store, traditional butcher shop, and casual cafe and farmer's market featuring locally sourced farm-to-table offerings. On February 17th, that vision became a reality when the Farm View Market in Madison, Georgia opened its doors. A trip down US 129 and 441, it's easy to see how a person can mistake this for your standard strip mall. But once inside, you immediately realize the Farm View Market is anything but your normal shopping experience. You know, one of the really cool things about this venue, because we do have the cafe, the market, the butcher shop, and soon the farmer's market, is that it really caters to growers and vendors of all sizes. You know, if it's somebody that's growing a specialty crop that's really high quality, um, they may want to source the cafe if they're already doing, you know, a lot of restaurant business. If they have a larger supply, um, they may want to supply the grocery. And then people that might be looking for um, supplemental income or who already have a, a job during the week and are looking for something to do on the weekends might be a perfect fit for the farmer's market. Uh, Morgan County is a big agritourism county. We have a lot of antebellum homes here and stuff. So we really want to be a, to fit into this community. And so uh, in a way that would be pleasing, in a way that would fit the agritourism model. And, uh, and, and this, this complex here, what you see now is the, is the first phase of it, but we hope to add more things. In fact, the farmer's market will go in in about three weeks. From there, we hope to put in a creamery next year, and we've got other things like pottery and woodworking and metalworking 
other artisan type shops that we hope will go in in the next two to three years to really make it a, a complex here where a person could come spend a half a day, could learn and could take educational courses on how to do some of those type things, uh, learn how to cut meat and do a lot of things that we're planning to add back to this whole thing. In addition to farming, Keith Kelly tells me he has a deep passion for wood, which explains why he went to great lengths to secure not one, but two barns that date as far back as the 1700s, both of which are focal points of the market. Unfortunately, you can't find these type of barns in the south. You have to get above a line in the country where powder post beetles and uh, termites don't exist. And so to find these barns, you have to go to the north. And uh, we found both these barns up in New York, upper New York with a company called Heritage Restorations that we uh, actually purchased them through. They were standing when we bought them. They went in and uh, took them down, deconstructed them, took them to Waco, Texas and refurbished them and brought them back here and stood them for us. And uh, the first barn where our butcher shop is, is about an 1830 to 40 English barn. And it was built as a hay barn. You could tell it by the structure of it that it was a hay barn. And it was in a region of the country where pastures and cattle and things were prominent. Uh, the other barn is a Dutch barn, and it was built somewhere around 1770. We don't have the exact date yet, but actually Cornell is doing an aging for us right now. And sitting under those barns, some of the finest products the state of Georgia has to offer. Names you may recognize, like Hillside Orchard, Mountain Fresh Creamery, and Georgia Olive Farms, just to name a few. Being Founders Circle Georgia Grown members, we went to the source. We contacted the Department of Agriculture and asked for the Georgia Grown members list and that's where we started. Throughout the store you'll see different designators on all of our products. Um, we have uh, products from Georgia, uh, we have products that are hyper local which to us means produced within 50 miles of our facility. We have products that are southern sourced which means they're from a state that borders Georgia. And then we also have our um, Georgia Grown and our Flavors of Georgia winner uh, designations throughout. Um, we're also featuring a lot of the Flavors of Georgia winners throughout our store. I don't know, it turned out really nice. And I, you know, the whole facility is, is, it did, it really exceeded my expectations. But more than that, people turning out have really, really exceeded my expectations. We're doing numbers today that I thought we would do, uh, you know, four or five months from now. <clears throat> so. It just has been accepted a lot faster than I anticipated. When we come back, Damon Jones with a recap of this year's Georgia Agritourism Conference. Information you need to know when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Stay with us. This is our Lhasa Apso Kip, who will soon be 14 years old. He has trouble getting around and his eyesight and hearing gets worse by the day but we've noticed other signs of decline. Kip seems not to recognize us at times and can be anxious and even aggressive. He shows many symptoms of cognitive dysfunction syndrome, a form of dementia for dogs. A fairly common thing that we hear is uh, less or abnormal interaction with the family. Veterinary neurologist Dr. Bill Thomas says dogs like Kip can suffer because of the aging of their brains but there are some chemical changes that happen in the brain. Uh, some of that's related to blood vessels, so as you mentioned, it could be a function of you know, not enough blood flow, uh, or some of these chemicals could actually be directly uh, toxic to the, to the brain cells. We've all heard that equation that one year for us is like seven years for a dog, but it's not quite that simple. Aging in canines depends on breed and size, and smaller dogs tend to live longer. However, like a human, the longer a dog lives, the greater their chance for a mental decline. Other symptoms here include a change in appetite and sleep patterns, fecal and urinary incontinence, and mostly behaviors like anxiety and confusion. Much like the human disease, there's no cure here. But animal behaviorist Dr. Julia Albright says we should keep our animals physically healthy and also engage them mentally. Having them use their senses um, ex um, exposing them to novel things. Um, it could be just as simple as a walk. Um, I had a client that the dog wasn't very mobile. They went on a car ride every day, uh, and that really seemed to kind of help get him excited. Pet owners should consult their veterinarian if their older dog is suffering. We love our animals and want them to enjoy their lives. 
Just know that dogs can change physically and mentally as they age, and a little compassion on your part is the best thing you can do for them. This is Charles Denny reporting. All right, welcome back to the program. Now time to make plans to attend the second annual gala for the Georgia Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture. Make note of the date. It is Saturday, April 16th. This year, the dinner and entertainment will be held at the Crown Plaza Ravinia in Atlanta. Members of the renowned Georgia 4-H Clovers and Company will provide entertainment and Dr. Bo Riles will serve as MC. Participation in the gala this year is really going to be about helping us fulfill our mission. And our mission for the gala and the foundation is going to be helping us support and enhance agriculture in the classroom to take the agricultural uh, conversation outside of the classroom into the ag communities and to the consumers. Uh, it's also about expanding uh, our young people and their investment in agriculture, participating in our scholarship program. For more information, log on to the web address that you see there. That is gfbfoundation.org. You can also contact your local County Farm Bureau office or the home office at 478-474-0679, extension 5231. With agriculture being the number one industry in our state and tourism being number two, it only makes sense that agritourism is becoming big business in Georgia. Yeah, and recently operators gathered in Rome for the association's third annual conference to get an update on the industry. Damon Jones was there and has the story. The Georgia Agritourism Association annual meeting in Rome provided operators a chance to display their products, hear from industry leaders, and get the latest update on issues facing the agritourism industry. It's a three-day event that touched on a number of different topics. Agritourism operators and their staff can come. They can learn about different regulatory issues that are going on within the agricultural industry in general, but how it specifically affects agritourism industry. Um, things like CUVA, the GATE program, um, even working with your la local ta tax assessors and your local tax government. As for the association itself, it provides these operators with a unified voice, which is a vital step in promoting the industry. For, for me to be able to go with somebody that's having problems in a county or bring some association representative, it's so powerful to be able to say, hey, look at the tax dollars that we're creating and there's just great benefit in jobs, green space, in uh, tax revenues and everything else in a community to support agritourism. And what better time than now to consider this type of operation as you can spread the story of agriculture to a willing audience while also maximizing your earning potential. The younger generation, they want to grow their own food. They want to garden in the backyard. They want their kids picking weeds, but they don't know how. They grew up in a neighborhood. And so they're hungry to learn and farmers are in the perfect position not only to be the teacher and the educator of, of the millennials and, and other generations, but also to take advantage of value added opportunities they have on their farm. And that's one of the main reasons agritourism has seen a rise in interest over the past few years. They want to find ways to, to utilize that land, for that land to be profitable. Sometimes it's a family member or members wanting to come back and live on that farm. So we get phone calls every week from folks wanting to utilize their land, increase their profitability, and sometimes just serve their community. That boost in interest was apparent at this year's conference where the increase in attendance provided better opportunity to network. Agritourism operators are farmers at heart. When they start talking, they start sharing stories, which leads to more stories. Then they get to find out from each other how they've handled issues, how they've overcome hurdles, how they've implemented successful programs uh, um, or, or marketing schemes. And that camaraderie is important for these operators as they know they have a number of different people they can count on. I want them to leave knowing that they're not alone. There's an entire industry of other agritourism operators that are facing the same exact scenarios every day. And they have a friend. Um, they have people that they can talk to and share with and find answers from. Reporting from Rome, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor.
Damon, nice job, sir. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and on the Farm Monitor show. Take care. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a fantastic week.